Um, and so as you can see, he's also authored uh, several books. And uh, one of them today he's going to focus on is the 10 biggest mistakes uh, that can wreck your um, car accident case. So um, with that, uh, again, thank you for joining. Please do put your questions in. We'll address them. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Mr. Davis. Well, thank you, Megan. I uh, am happy to be here. And welcome to everybody that's come on. Um, I, uh, before I kind of get to the information in, in one of my books, I thought I would just start out um, generally and discuss, you know, some of the, the common issues or questions that I get from prospective clients who uh, have either uh, been injured and think they have a claim or have questions about whether they have a claim. And then I'll talk about a little bit about insurance policies and what to look for and the differences between a third-party policy and a first-party policy. And then also talk about um, important things having to do with settlement, how to uh, prepare an effective settlement demand and what the insurance company typically looks for. And then I'll, I'll talk about the information in my book. Um, it is true that I've written uh, a handful of books now, and, and one of the biggest uh, or most popular books that I have right now is called The Ten Biggest Mistakes That Can Wreck Your, your Case. And we probably get at least two to 300 uh, requests per month for this book. So I know it's it's useful, and I know people have given us, lots of people have given us uh, positive feedback about it. Let me just first start off about, you know, the, the number one question is, is whether a person actually has a personal injury claim. And by that I mean, does a claim exist where there may be an obliga obligation by the other person or other corporation or a governmental entity to pay you compensation for injuries that you have received? And uh, Legally, there are four elements that have to be met. Uh, those elements are duty, the breach of a duty, causation, and damages. And I don't want to get too complicated here or too legalistic, but essentially you've got to show that another person or entity uh, was negligent. And many people don't understand what negligence means, and it's just a fancy word to mean that someone or some person or corporation has acted carelessly. So if you can show that another party uh, failed to exercise ordinary care, and as a result, because of that conduct or because of that omission, uh, you were injured and you've sustained damages, then you do have a personal injury claim. Uh, m many cases that we handle, it's very easy to tell if a personal injury claim ha exists. For instance, car accident cases probably the number one type of personal injury claim. And usually you can tell whether you know a, uh, one of the rules of the road were, were violated. Um, but in other cases, like a trip and fall or maybe a medical malpractice act, uh, case, it may not be easily determined. Um, and so in those types of cases, there might be additional investigation that might be uh, required. Now getting on. Assuming you do have a claim, the next question, important question, is is there insurance to cover damages? This is a very important question because uh, even if you do have a claim, if the other party uh, doesn't have an insurance policy in place that would cover the loss, it can be uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to collect damages for that claim. Uh, many people uh, ask me, well, can't you sue the person, take them to court, and try to go after the personal assets? Uh, the short answer is yes, but that's an enormous amount of work and effort. And there is no guarantee that if you are successful in a trial, that the person has sufficient assets to pay a verdict. Uh, so most personal injury lawyers are not going to accept a case unless there is a policy at play here. Um, there's a difference between the types of insurance coverage that may apply. We've got uh, what is typically called a third-party policy. That is the policy that is held by the defendant or the alleged negligent party. Um, that insurance company only owes a, a duty to its own insurer. Uh, that means that the insurance company for the other person can deny the claim, can stall, can delay, can refuse to uh, answer your communications or refuse to answer a settlement demand. And legally, they're, they are within their right to do so. The second type of policy is what we call first-party insurance policy. That's a policy that you, the person bringing the claim, uh, 
has. Uh, and typically that might include your own auto policy, like PIP benefits, which is, uh, stands for personal injury protection benefits, or a private health insurance policy, or a disability policy. With first party insurance policy claims, it's almost always advisable to seek the benefits that those policies allow you for damages that are attributed by the other party because there are special rules in place that obligate that insurance company to act promptly and to handle your claim with care. So for instance, uh, in an auto accident, uh, the other driver is going to probably have their own policy. You're going to have your own policy as well. And typically, most people have what they call PIP, or personal injury protection, which allows for no-fault medical. Typically, it is, it is advisable for you, the claimant, to make a claim under your own policy so that your medical treatment is paid for timely and promptly, so your bills don't go to collection. Um, and if they don't pay, if, you're, if your insurance company does not pay, then there are regulations in place which can provide you with some enforcement mechanism to make sure that they're timely meeting the responsibilities. Again, the other party's insurance company really has no obligation uh, to pay uh, your medical bills or to pay you even a settlement if, if they don't believe a claim exists or if they don't believe a sizable or valid claim exists. So those are the different, two different types of, pol of policies that are usually at play in a typical personal injury case. Um, the third topic that I'd like to cover has to do with settlement and the importance of documentation. Uh, insurance companies are driven by documentation. What that means is if you are making a claim for damages, the elements of your claim have to be supported by documents, uh, oftentimes independent documents. So for instance, in a car accident case, the insurance adjuster is going to want to see a copy of the police traffic collision report or the officer's report or witness statements that the officer may have taken or witness statements that maybe you have taken um, because that is important to establishing negligence or liability for who caused the accident. Uh, the adjuster is almost always going to need that important piece of information for the file. Uh, the second, uh, now the documentation on liability might also include photographs or diagrams of the scene of the accident, or if this is a trip and fall case, perhaps uh, photographs of the unsafe condition that caused your fall. So documentation on the liability part of the claim, i.e. proving that another party was negligent or careless, is extremely important. The second uh, type of documentation is going to address damages. Uh, the adjuster will typically refuse to consider any type of damage that you're claiming unless you have some independent proof or documentation to support it. So in personal injury claims, as you might imagine, the medical records are extremely important. So are the medical billings. Uh, all of that information will usually have to be provided to the, to the, to the insurance adjuster before that adjuster even considers making you a settlement offer. If you are claiming other types of damages, for instance, receipts of expenses you might have, been, you might have incurred because of your injuries, uh, for instance, if you had to hire somebody to mow the, your lawn for a period of time, you will need copies of those receipts. If you're claiming um, lost wages or income loss, you'll typically need to show pay stubs or documentation from your employer. If you're self-employed, you will definitely need copies of your tax returns or, form, or 1099 forms. All of that information will not be considered as far as your losses go unless there's documentation to support the claim. So during the pendency of your claim, if you're handling it on your own, you should be keeping a file of all of the uh, incidental damages, uh, all of the amounts that you are claiming uh, as part of your damages. Uh, because uh, many times claims do not settle for, mo for months or even years uh, the file may need to be put in a safe place, and you'll be expected to probably periodically update that file as your damages um, accrue. Um, let's get into some of the topics that I've written about in, in some of my books. And uh, Megan mentioned at the very outset my book, The Ten Biggest Mistakes. And these are, uh, I've actually been representing accident victims for about 17 years now. And over the years, you know, I get common questions, common scenarios that we receive from people 
or um, common issues or problems that we see in the cases that we handle. So I've compiled a list of some of those common uh, mistakes, and, and, I'll, and I'll briefly share them here. And by the way, um, you know, I offer my books free to accident victims in Washington State. And if you would like a free copy of my book, just go to uh, WashingtonAccidentBook.com to request your free copy. The first mistake that we see um, is uh, a person who's been injured and wants to pursue a claim uh, but fails to seek medical attention or fails to seek timely medical attention. Um, as I said before, uh, injuries are really not going to be given uh, validity by the insurance company unless there's documentation to support that they even exist. So you're going to need to see some type of doctor so a chart record is made so that you can prove to the adjuster that, yes, you were injured, these were your symptoms, and these, this is the type of treatment that has been recommended by the health care provider. People that wait days or weeks to, to, following the accident to see a health care provider can, go, can cause substantial problems in the case. Uh, ultimately, a case is, uh, the value of a case is decided by a jury. So uh, both sides are trying to predict how a jury might see the case. For, for cases where uh, a person waits days or weeks before seeking medical attention, to many jurors, that does not appear like a very um, strong claim, or it does not appear that the person was that injured if the person could wait a week or two before seeing the medical doctor. So in those types of cases, it can be very difficult to convince a jury, if necessary, that the person was injured from that accident, enough so, so that proper medical treatment was required. The second mistake. Uh, that we see is when a person uh, contacts, one of the first people the, the person contacts is a lawyer, and the person actually goes to a doctor referred by the lawyer. And of course, once the chart notes come back, the doctor's chart notes shows that it was the lawyer that's making the referral, um, which can look highly suspect to an insurance company. Uh, you have to remember that this is a very adversarial process between you and the insurance company. So the insurance company is going to be looking for anything in the records that might support their claim that you might be exaggerating, that you might be padding your, your damages, or that you might be uh, shopping for the right medical opinion. So where people are referred by lawyers and that shows up in the records, that can be a very uh, big hurdle to overcome when trying to settle the claim for a reasonable value. The third mistake that we see is when the client is involved in an accident, typically it's a motor vehicle accident, where the client, I'm referring as a client, but the person who's been hurt in the accident fails to gather sufficient information at the accident scene. For instance, the name and address of the other driver, perhaps the license number, uh, perhaps there are witnesses that see the accident, and uh, yet those, those uh, persons' names and addresses are not collected. Um, many times when the claim is resolved months down the road, if there's insufficient information to show what happened or who the person was that was at fault or what, witness, uh, what witnesses were present and what they observed, that can be difficult to proving liability. Uh, for me, it's not uncommon for us to get into a claim and for stories to change. Uh, for instance, somebody might admit fault to you at the scene of the accident, but months later, change his or her mind or offer new information that wasn't told to you that might uh, defeat your claim as to showing or proving that the other person was negligent. So not gathering enough information at the scene can be a big mistake. Uh, the fourth mistake is if the client or the person gives too much information to the other person's insurance company. Uh, typically, the at-fault a person's insurance company is going to want to take a recorded statement. I almost always advise people to refuse a recorded statement. One, the recorded statement is for the benefit of the insurance company, and two, uh, at worst, uh, it will, uh, or at best, it will simply uh, reinforce what you already know, and at worst, it will provide information, recorded information for the insurance company to either deny the claim or minimize the value of your claim. So. Going into too much detail right after the accident about uh, your injuries and so forth might be a big mistake. Uh, 
Uh, it might not be. But to play it safe, I usually advise people only to give information about you know, the date of the accident, uh, what happened in a very concise way, and perhaps tell the adjuster what areas of, of your body hurt and leave it at that. Uh, that is more than sufficient for the adjuster to open up the claim and then manage that claim from beginning to end. Um, the next mistake that we see is people who are se severely injured but uh, delay hiring a lawyer. Uh, there are many claims that do not need the assistance of a lawyer. The smaller claims usually do not, and there are no hard and fast rules about what a small claim is, but usually if it, a small claim exists if the, if the treatment lasts no longer than a few months, the injuries are not permanent, and perhaps the medical bills are just a few thousand dollars. Um, but for bigger claims, for instance, claims that involve you know, serious permanent injury or significant damages where there's a lot of money at stake, uh, it can be a big mistake for a person to delay hiring a professional um, because there are mistakes that, that can be done early on in the claim that can defeat the claim or minimize the claim that may not be correctable after one hires a lawyer. So for the bigger claims, the more serious claims, it's almost always advisable to get the professional in on the claim as early as possible to help you manage that claim and secure the best result. The next mistake that we see, number six, is where um, if the person does hire a lawyer to pursue the claim, that person hides uh, past accidents or hides past accidents from the insurance company, you know, falsely tells the adjuster that the person had never been in an accident when that is in fact not true. Uh, number one, that really permanently damages your credibility, um, in which case, you know, many adjusters will refuse to even make an offer or will make an extremely low offer because they just don't believe you now about how you were injured or how the injuries have affected your life. Uh, mistake number seven that we see is, is along the similar vein where a person tries to hide their past medical history uh, or medical conditions, either from the, their lawyer or from the insurance adjuster. Um, again, that's going to impact your credibility. For instance, if you've been in an accident where you've hurt your neck and uh, a year earlier you injured your neck uh, in another accident, almost always the insurance company is going to have knowledge of that prior accident, either because you made a claim for property damage or injury claim, and there's a, a vast database that insurance companies use, so they keep track of this information. So trying to hide past medical injuries or condition uh, can really destroy your claim, and if you've got legal counsel, can make it virtually impossible for your lawyer to get the best possible result in your case. Mistake number eight that we see is where the person makes statements to his or her doctors, damaging statements to their health care provider that show up in the medical records. Uh, for example, if you describe the accident as a fender bender or that the person just bumped you and it was no big deal, uh, when in fact it was a big deal, but you're just trying to remain stoic and, and you know, for the benefit of the doctor, statements like that can hurt your claim. Uh, again, the adjuster is going to be looking for anything in your medical records to minimize the extent of your injury. So if there are statements in the records where you're telling the doctor you're not hurt that bad, you, you, you feel fine when in fact you don't, or the accident was just a minor fender bender, um, those statements can drastically uh, reduce the value of your claim. And if they show up in the records as a lawyer, it's almost impossible for me to overcome those statements not without sufficient work or not without uh, much more treatment and expert opinions from other doctors to refute those statements. But even, even if I have that information, because they show up in the records, uh, if the case were to ever go to trial, typically the defense attorney will blow up those records into a big poster so that the jury can see how you were describing the accident in such an insignificant way. And that can be very, very powerful evidence to a jury to award minimal compensation or award no compensation because they don't believe the accident was that bad or they don't believe your injuries were that severe. Mistake number nine that we see is when the client really makes medical appointments but either fails to make those appointments or goes long periods of time without seeing a doctor, which we've referred to gaps in treatment. If you are having symptoms from your accident, 
you should be regularly seeing the doctor. Um, we get cases where somebody might treat for a few months and then stop treating for six months or longer or even just a few months and then pick back up again and resume treatment. When we have those gaps in care, again, the adjuster is going to latch on to that and, and wonder, well, he stopped treating uh, and then didn't pick up again until six months later. How do we know he wasn't injured again? Or why would he stop treating unless he was feeling 100% better? Um, so those types of things that we see can also be very big challenges in a case and be difficult to overcome when trying to settle the case for a reasonable value. Finally, number 10, uh, clients or people, injured victims that either misrepresent how the accident has affected them or give false information. Uh, and to, with today's technology, it's very easy for insurance companies to hire people for minimal expense to go out and surreptitiously, surreptitiously tape record, video record people just going about their daily lives. Um, and so I do see on occasion an investigator show up in a case with, with video footage showing the person working at a tremendously um, uh, challenging, physically, physically challenging job, which seems to conflict with perhaps what the medicals are, are stating or conflict with what the person is saying as far as how that accident um, affected their, their lives. Um, you always have to be cautious uh, that everything you do in public may be being observed by somebody with, from the insurance company or representing the insurance company's interests. Um, it also can apply if you are, for instance, um, submitting applications to your own insurance company, either for disability benefits or health insurance benefits, where you make statements about your activity level that seem to contradict what your medical records state. Uh, I've seen, for instance, in one case, an application made for life insurance, where the application listed the person where he described his activity level is fairly robust, no problems, no serious medical problems, yet he had an ongoing personal injury claim where he was trying to claim that the, that the accident had severely affected his work activities and recreational activities. So when the adjuster found out about that ap application, there was a significant problem there because there was a discrepancy, and I was unable to secure probably the result that I wanted to secure in that case because of that uh, unrelated uh, insurance application. So. There you have it, 10 mistakes. Megan, I'm willing to answer questions if we have some. OK, great, we do. Um, all right, so the first question I have here is, I was injured while on foot by someone riding a bike. What should I do? Is this at all like a car accident? Um, yes and no. It's, it's like a car accident in the sense that you have to prove that the bike rider was careless, was negligent in some way, and as a result of that negligence caused you injury. The difference, however, is with insurance. Obviously, most bike riders do not have their own bicycle insurance. However, uh, I am finding that many homeowners' policies are covering bicycle-related injuries. Uh, so what I would do is certainly contact that person, the bike rider, and ask that person for his homeowner's insurance. Um, Unfortunately, unless a lawsuit is filed, there's really no way to force that person to reveal that information uh, unless perhaps you take that person to small claims court or hire a lawyer on your own. So uh, the short answer is yes, it is similar to uh, other types of injury claims in the sense that you must establish negligence, but there might be differences when it comes to insurance coverage. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Says how how do you deal with an insurance company that has agreed in email to pay certain things, and yet a check has never showed up and they stop returning all communication? The outstanding amount would would fall into small claims amount. Do I really have to go through that process? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, as I said at the outset, there's really no legal obligation for the other person's insurance company to offer you a settlement. Uh, in this particular case, you might have some grounds uh, based on contract principles that they agreed to pay you an amount. 
Um, but in these types of cases, uh, which really happens uh, quite frequently, unfortunately, the only recourse would be to sue that person. Uh, and uh, small claims is one option. Hiring a lawyer is another option. But yes, once you file suit, then you have the, the law behind you. Uh, unfortunately, though, you're going to have to prove your case, and you're gonna, you may incur some expense doing that. But that usually is the, the only recourse that you're going to have if the insurance company either stops answering your communication or refuses to offer a settlement that they initially promised. Uh, there's a follow-up to that. What if it is my insurance company, not the other parties? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, as I said at the outset, if it's your insurance company, you're going to have some added teeth in forcing them to respond. Uh, there are laws in place in Washington that govern how the claims practices should be handled. So if they're not responding promptly, uh, one uh, alternative would be to contact the Washington State Insurance Commissioner. Uh, sometimes uh, contacting the, the commissioner and lodging a complaint is enough to get your own carrier back on track and responding to your communications. Uh, sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes the insurance com commissioner won't do anything. Uh, for a variety of reasons, in which case then you're back to square one and then you may be forced to file suit against your own company. Okay. Uh, there's another one here that says, is there a statute of limitation for when insurance companies pay? Uh, it depends on what insurance company. If we're talking about the other persons, the at-fault person's insurance company, um, we're talking about uh, the statute of limitations for a typical personal injury claim, which is usually three years from the date of the injury or from the date that the negligence occurred or, or the date that the discovery of the negligence occurred. Um, for first-party insurance companies, for instance, uh, claims that you have against your own company under the terms of your own policy, normally the statute of limitations is going to be the same one that is used for contract cases. And in contract cases in, in Washington, the statute of limitations is six years. I have to caution people, though, that <clears throat> there are facts and circumstances that can affect when the statute arises or which statute of limitation applies. So uh, usually it's a good idea to consult with an attorney to make sure what that statute of limitations might be for your case. OK. We have a couple other questions here. Um, I've heard that when someone hits you and the person you who hit you's insurance company asks you to fill out a sheet explaining what happened in a car accident, you shouldn't do it without talking to a lawyer. Is that true? Uh, to be safe, I usually tell people not to, to fill out uh, documents or sign documents for the adverse uh, insurance company. However, um, for smaller cases where the information that's being produced, for instance, might be a list of your medical providers um, or the names of witnesses, um, if you're going to be handling your own claim, then the insurance company is going to get access to that information anyway, so it might help you to provide that information early on in the claim. Um, if you get beyond that, for instance, if they want documentation or for you to fill out a narrative report about how the accident occurred or um, offer more specifics about your injuries, then yes, now you're getting into a gray area where statements that you make or put down in writing can come back to haunt you in the claim. Uh, it may not haunt you. Um, so it may be a good idea to have a lawyer look at it or consider it before doing that. Okay. Uh, one other question here. Um, my son was injured in a football game. He hurt his arm, um, but the coaches didn't do anything for him um, after the game. And he rode home um, on a bus uh, for about an hour, and again, they didn't put anything on his arm, no ice or anything. So when he got home, we found out that it was broken, um, and now it's been several weeks later, and the doctors don't think that he will uh, be able to fully extend his arm. Mm -hmm. uh, do I have a case against the school or the coaches, or what should we do? Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the short answer is maybe, and, and here's why. Um, 
you likely do not have a claim uh, against the school of the coaches just because an injury occurred during, during a high-risk sporting activity. Washington recognizes uh, a doctrine known as assumption of risk. So uh, getting broken arms in football is, I would argue, probably a, a risk of that activity. So probably a claim, a, a successful claim for, for the initial injury does not exist. However, um, if the coaches or the school fail to provide proper medical attention for that injury, and it sounds like they very, mel, very may, uh, might have, um, when they should have known that medical attention should have been provided immediately or right after the incident, uh, then there may be a claim for that uh, alleged negligence. Um, the, the, the real issue, though, comes down to proving um, if he doesn't have use, regular use of the arm or if he can't extend it, the question really becomes, okay, is that due to the original injury itself? suffered in the game, or is that limitation due to, due to the delay in treatment that the district or the coaches may not have provided? Uh, that's not an easy answer uh, or question to answer. It may very well require uh, expert medical attest testimony. So if you've got a doctor that is saying, well, if, if, the, if the kid had received treatment right away like it should have been done, then he would have had no further limitations uh, would have made a 100% recovery. If you've got a doctor stating that, then you might have a, co uh, a, si or a co cognizant claim, a viable claim against the district for the delay in treatment. But it's going to require some sort of uh, expertise by a medical doctor to establish causation. That is, whatever the district did not do, delay in treatment, caused some of the harm that the boy is experiencing now, and that it's not due to the initial injury. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis, and thank you, everybody, for joining today. Um, again, really appreciate everybody's time and hope that uh, you had your questions answered and uh,